So at the end of last year, a very long feeling three and a half years after finishing my eight and a half year PhD, this book version of it was published, the rather day glow blue book on the right hand side. So I show it here amongst some of its stable mates because that's the only way I can tolerate uh, its cover, I suppose as a kind of strength in numbers. Also, there are some pretty cool titles in the series too. I won't be able to get through the contents of the book in under 10 minutes, and in any case, I'm going to use instead the structure of my PhD that the book was based on. These then are the chapter titles of that PhD. The book needed to be about a third of its size, so the structure had to change somewhat, but this version I think is more useful for uh, my purposes here. In fact, this presentation uh, during this presentation, I will only get about this far. The first two chapters are sort of scene setting chapters, and this feels, or this feels like it will be a good place to pause the presentation. Um, chapter one then was called Reconstruction because it drew together the various strands of the thesis and a kind of extended introduction. It sets out the central idea that the space between the disciplines of architecture and archaeology because those disciplines are connected historically, it's available for interdisciplinary practice. And the idea of interdisciplinarity is central to, the, to this thesis and the research that's associated with this thesis. So here listed are the aims and objectives, which we won't dwell on because they're kind of fairly dry, I suppose. Um, but also because this is a recorded presentation, you can always stop and read them if you want to. I will really briefly go through the aims, but perhaps, but not the objectives. So number one was to show that through theoretical and practice led processes, architectural design and archaeological reconstruction, normally thought of as two completely different things, are both modes of propositional making. You make something that wasn't there before. Um, so that's the sense of uh, the proposition that I'm using. Two, to demonstrate that resemblances between architecture and archaeology are homological in basis, and therefore available to systematic study. And probably not in this presentation, maybe if I do a follow up one with further chapters, I'll talk about what I mean by um, a, a homological connection between uh, disciplines. Uh, I'll go some way towards that here, but perhaps not really get to the root of the uh, technical meaning of that term. And three, having revealed these occluded resemblances, hidden resemblances, to demonstrate that interdisciplinary practice between architecture and archaeology may be beneficial to both. So what's the point um, in talking about an interdisciplinary space between um disciplines that share homological similarities. Why am I uh, doing that? And again, hopefully that will be revealed, uh, perhaps if not through this presentation, then again through maybe subsequent short uh, presentations that uh, I might do. But to understand the kind of interdisciplinarity that I'm interested in, and that uh, I hope is revealed through this research, you first need to understand something, or I needed to understand something about being disciplinary. Um, and in this chapter, I try to say something about the two disciplines I'm interested in, architecture and archaeology, and why those disciplines might be interesting models rather than um, uninteresting models or trivial models, should I say, for a, a wider understanding of the idea of interdisciplinarity. So this body of research began, although I, I didn't realise it at the time, in 2003 at a paleontology evening class I took at Birkbeck, University of London, as a break from running my small architectural practice, which I've been doing since uh, 2000. And although I was enjoying running my own practice, um, it, was, it was architecture morning, noon and night, and uh, that I had a long-standing interest in archaeology and human evolution, and paleontology sort of covers all of those, um, all of those categories, I, I suppose. At one point, I remember during uh, that that evening class, we were tasked with sketching 
uh, a number of stone tools that the um, that the teacher had uh, because it was although it was Birkbeck it was run at the Institute of Archaeology which is just around the uh, corner so they have these rooms and these drawers that you open up and they're full of all of these genuine Neolithic, Mesolithic, Paleolithic uh, stone tools um, and we were tasked to, to, to draw them. This is a kind of really quick, really quick sketch uh, that I did of it as you can kind of see it's just on a lined uh, notebook Later, triggered by this, in a nutshell, I began to ask myself about the kind of uncanny feeling I'd had of usefully practising with the tools and using the techniques of my discipline, architecture, within the framework of a completely different discipline, in this case, archaeology. And it had come up upon me, I suppose, a kind of re a sort of revelatory moment that there was this kind of strange doubling going on, using the tools and techniques of my discipline within, um, uh, I wasn't practising archaeology, of course, uh, but I was suppose, as I would phrase it now, I was practising towards uh, some idea of a discipline uh, of archaeology. This uncanniness, that, uh, that feeling of doubling, uh, comes about, I argue, because architecture and archaeology's proto-discipline antiquarianism was historically pretty much the same thing so as you can see from this diagram archaeology emerges out of some notion of antiquarianism architecture is pretty consistent as a profession but back in back in the day if you like antiquarianism and architecture were sort of practiced simultaneously you wouldn't have thought of the idea of going to Athens uh, and Rome and understanding the ruins and artefacts that you might find there as any different from then the subsequent practice of taking those artefacts and making drawn reconstructions of them and producing a kind of propositional um, architecture. So by the time on this diagram, as you can see, we get to the 19th century, archaeology is well on its way to becoming the scientifically based discipline that it is now. Um, there are other practice, practitioners of archaeology don't think of it as a primarily scientific subject, they think of it in lots of other perhaps more postmodern terms, um, but at its core most um, practitioners of archaeology think of themselves uh, as scientists. Um, so archaeology is well on its way to becoming the scientifically based discipline it is now. Meanwhile, architecture, in order to protect its markets, threw up barriers around itself controlling access to what was now properly uh, a profession. So it wanted to distinguish itself from surveying, for, for example, antiquarianism for sure, by, by setting up uh, gatekeepers to itself as a sort of uh, newly professionalised discipline, the birth of um, the RBA at around about uh, that time, for example, uh, is indicative of that. Um, archaeology is now doing the same thing. Um, so uh, lagging behind, if you like, um, thankfully, uh, I would say it now also wants to uh, professionalise um, the activities, and the, the tools and techniques of its uh, practitioners as well, and it's undergoing quite a, a radical change. Um, so archaeology is doing the same thing, uh, so it, but it appears to veer away from the, uh, the ideas of architecture. While architecture becomes increasingly specialised also, as we know that it is, resisting any kind of sustaining interdisciplinary alliances with other disciplines. And I think that's uh, a problem for architecture, has been a problem for architecture, as it's becoming a problem for archaeology as well. Nevertheless, and despite their best efforts to, con to conceal their connections, you know, they were once thought of as a joint discipline back, uh, back when they were uh, antiquarianism, architecture as a, so as a sort of joint discipline. Despite their best efforts to conceal those original homological connections, ripples of connectivity continue to connect architecture and archaeology together. And you can see in this rather hastily drawn diagram that I've shown uh, though that sort of ripple effect, the idea that each discipline continues to affect the other discipline despite their uh, uh, veering away from another, their purported difference in, in their kind of aims. Um, 
the book and the PhD, so the book that I showed you at the beginning and the PhD it was based upon are about what is possible in this ripply space, let's call it, between these two disciplines and by extension between any homologically uh, related discipline or, or even disciplines. So here's an example of what this shift in thinking can reveal, I would say. It was a kind of hastily drawn sketch, or at least there's an earlier version of this hastily drawn sketch where I wanted to explain to my PhD supervisors what I was, uh, or my thinking processes about this kind of these connections between these two disciplines and how those connections might actually uh, manifest themselves. So that, so that the processes of architecture, if you like, and the processes of archaeology might productively be thought of as just one kind of process. In Brownfield's site, if I'm an architect, if I'm looking at that site with my architectural lens uh, on, to building, to ruin, to buried artefact, to archaeological site, if I'm looking at exactly the same place through my archaeological lens, if you like. So here are those ripples of ever receding influence. So that kind of hastily drawn sketch and the other and the sketch that you saw before it are just sort of examples of or earlier versions of this kind of slightly tarted up uh, version of this idea that disciplines are um, uh, appear isolated from one another. Maybe they have kind of radically different looking objectives. Uh, but in fact, disciplines don't have boundaries ar around them. They have ever receding spheres uh, of influence. You don't stand within uh, a discipline in one place and take a step and then you're the other side of a barrier. Uh, this model that I've developed really thinks about disciplines as um, cent strong centres with ever receding ripples of influence. So in any given place that you might stand in a disciplinary sense, um, you're always under the influence, and it might be very, very faint influence of any other discipline at all. And the stronger you are, the stronger the homological connection, the historical connection, say, with another discipline, the stronger that influence might be. Uh, and I would say that the recently split, sundered disciplines of architecture and archaeology mean that uh, practising between them can be, ought to be, should be, is a really fruitful exercise that you can make uh, strong work between those two uh, disciplines. So in subsequent research shorts, um, uh, so the idea is that I might divide up the, the, the thesis of the PhD as represented through the book Scandalous Space, that I might divide the ideas up and go through a series of chapters. So this is chapter one and two, and I might do uh, subsequent chapters and subsequent research shorts. I'll describe the journey that I took through my research from architecture towards, ar towards archaeology. So this is a sort of zoom in, if you like, of that kind of ripple diagram that you've just seen uh, that maps out the different moves I made, the different um, uh, forays I made as an architect using the tools and techniques of my discipline, but moving towards this idea of a different discipline by um, doing things uh, in archaeological uh, contexts. And I'll, and I'll say more uh, about those uh, as I go on. And also, I will crucially talk about what I mean by the term scandal and how the idea of the scandal relates to all of this. So until next time, thank you.